Many, many thanks, Marion, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you to the committee, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here in, in Paris. I'm apologising that I can't speak to you in French. I would love to, but um, hopefully you understand my accent. Um, now, this field is, is very... Uh, it's fairly well established now, despite being maybe only 13 years old, roughly. Um, but there's many activities underway right across the world uh, that um, are still in their nascency. So there's some things we can discuss today and other things that over the next 12 to 18 months you will see coming up in the literature that are very, very exciting. So I wanted to give you an, um, an overview of the field, what we know so far, um, what we've been doing recently, and then, of course, where we're going with the Food and Mood Centre. So nutritional psychiatry is where these two leading... Um, causes of global disease burden meet. We know that poor diet and the, our industrialised food system globally is the leading cause of illness and early death through its impact on chronic disease. We also know that mental disorders, of course, impose a huge burden of disability around the world, uh, as well as increasingly neurodevelopmental disorders, dementia as well. So nutritional psychiatry is really focuses on research that develops and evaluates nutritional approaches to the prevention and treatment of mental and brain disorders, as well as their comorbidities, and then the application of this evidence base. And this, of course, has implications for clinical practice, for public health, prevention, and definitely for food policy. And a lot of what I do is talking to policymakers and, and um, being an activist, I guess, to, to get change in our global food environment. What it isn't, though, is complementary medicine, integrative medicine, alternative medicine, and functional medicine. Now, these words, rightly or wrongly, have a connotation attached to them, which is soft science, not very evidence-based, um, or in many cases, no data whatsoever. So we really focus on generating gold standard, very good evidence uh, to um, allow us then to integrate what we're, our knowledge and the, the research outcomes into clinical guidelines and into public policy with some degree of confidence. The work that we've led has had a big impact at the level of the public. And of course, everybody eats several times a day and everybody has a brain. Everyone is concerned with their own mental health, with their own uh, children and their, their, their brain as they age. All of these factors affect everybody. And I think when you think about um, public health and the conversation around food and diet for the last two decades, it's really focused on body size and body weight. And we feel that this is not a particularly useful focus because it's stigmatising, but it also is something that people find very difficult to change. And so they give up, they turn off to the messaging and they feel um, disempowered. What we know from our research is when you focus the messaging on mental and brain health and people understand that this is relevant to them immediately, then it really does have an impact on their behaviour and um, the way that they take on those messages. What I'm not going to talk to you today about is, is supplements, nutritional supplements. Um, to my mind, even though we do do some research in looking at supplements and plant compounds in our centre, Supplements, uh, nutritional, um, you know, things that people can take are not equivalent to food. They're not even vaguely equivalent to food because when we're talking about food, and we're talking here about, say, for example, plant food, we're considering the possible nearly 150,000 different phytochemicals that are found in all the different types of plant food. <coughs> Excuse me. As well as the food matrix itself. When you take nutrients, vitamins, minerals, what have you, out of that food matrix, out of that context, they don't work in the same way and they're definitely not equivalent. However, if you are interested, there are some very good uh, meta-reviews that look at the evidence. There's a little bit of evidence for some things such as methylfolate, a bit of evidence for vitamin D. It's not hugely strong, though. What we do have, though, is a very large and consistent body of evidence from around the world from the epidemiological literature, the observational studies, which links the quality of people's diets to their risk of developing depression. Now, this could be in Japan, China, Brazil, India, the UK, the US, etc. Across the world, we see over and over again 
that people who have a healthier diet, one that's more akin to their traditional diet with whole foods and a reduced intake of processed, ultra-processed foods, the risk of developing depression is reduced by about 30%, 35%. Now, this is independent of things such as education and income. It's independent of body weight. It's not explained by body size, BMI. It's not explained by reverse causality, people eating a certain way because of their mental health problems. So these are prospective data and they're very consistent with a dose-response relationship. Now, most of the evidence to date in nutritional psychiatry is focused on depression as well as anxiety to a lesser extent, but we are now starting to see the field move towards examination of, of various other um, uh, diseases and um, conditions, including, for example, we're doing a pilot trial in schizophrenia in Finland looking at the ketogenic diet. Importantly, we see this across the life course. So we know that the average age of onset for many of the common mental disorders is around adolescence. And indeed, half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14. So if we want to think about prevention, we really need to focus on factors that can be modified. And in this regard, the fact that there are very extensive data linking the quality of young people's diets to their mental health, again in a dose-response fashion, independent of many family factors, family conflict, poor family management, family socioeconomic status, is really important. And when we look at these two constructs here, you have the intake of these unhealthful foods and ultra-processed foods, and also a low intake of these foods, the foods that have the phytochemicals and the fiber and um, the really important fatty acids, et cetera, that we know are so important for, for mental and brain health as well as um, physical health. Both of these things are independently linked to poor mental health outcomes. So you get a lot of young people who might be having a lot of these sorts of foods at home, these healthful foods, but then they're also going and having lots of these before, during, after school, at their friends' houses. This is still a problem. They are not just the opposite of each other. They're both independently linked to worse mental health outcomes. And then we go right back to the start of life, and there's an extensive body of evidence now represented in this uh, meta-analysis to show that maternal diet quality is linked to children's emotional, behavioural outcomes as well as their neurodevelopmental and cognitive outcomes. And it's not a huge effect size. Of course, there are many, many things that influence uh, children's outcomes. But we also know that mothers' diets during pregnancy are linked to their um, postnatal depression, which then in turn has an impact on mental health in the young people. But there also seems to be this direct relationship. And again, the data are consistent. And um, although the message needs to be delivered very carefully, because of course, mothers are always getting the blame for things. And uh, we know that it really should not be up to individuals to be making these choices. We need to change the food environment via food policy to support people to eat better. It's not just women, though. We see in the literature from very large studies in Norway that there's a dose-response relationship between the level of uh, overweight and obesity in the fathers and the risk for autism spectrum disorder in the children. That's independent, again, of a very wide range of factors. And when we consider that 60% of children alive today in the US will be clinically obese by the time they're in their childbearing years, this has real implications for the next generation of children. This is one of the studies we published last year where we looked at maternal diet and children's diet and we looked at ADHD symptoms and diagnoses. And this was with um, large registry data in Norway. And we see the relationships that um, we hypothesised, although I have to say I was quite surprised myself because I've always understood ADHD to be very genetically driven, but it does seem to have this relationship with um, diet quality. Um, so this uh, measure here was a measure of healthful food intake, and this measure here was a measure of ultra-processed food intake. And this is the children's uh, diet quality, which had a less strong uh, relationship um, but that was controlling for the mothers. So we see this with neurodevelopmental um, outcomes as well. And again, this is, these are data from Australia, but they're certainly representative of uh, North America and the UK, where 99% of children are not having their recommended intake of vegetables, legumes, 
these foods that are so essential for their mental and brain health, their gut health. So this is not something that just affects people from low socioeconomic status, it affects everybody, and that's because of our global food environment. Again, thinking about the determinants of mental health and mental disorders, they're very often things that are difficult to change. They're things like uh, genetics and early life trauma and life stress and poverty. But lifestyle factors, including diet, can be modified, and this makes them very powerful targets for prevention. We also have now uh, very nice literature from um, intervention studies. The SMILES trial was the first um, trial, randomised control trial, to test the hypothesis that one might take people with a clinical mental disorder, help them to improve their diet, and that this would have an impact on their depression. So what we did here was we recruited people with moderate to severe major depressive disorder. Many of them had been very sick for a long time. Uh, most were on other types of treatment, psychotherapy and or antidepressant treatment, and they were randomly assigned to receive either social support, which we know is helpful for people with depression, or nutritional support with a clinical dietitian. And what we saw was a very pronounced impact on uh, depressive symptoms, such that a full 30% of people in the dietary group actually went on to achieve a full remission of their depression with a very large effect size. What we also saw was a very tight relationship between the degree to which people changed their diet and the degree to which their symptoms improved. We also did economic mod modelling that showed that our uh, dietary intervention was highly cost effective. There was roughly a two and a half thousand Australian dollar cost saving per participant because they lost less time out of role, they saw other health pr practitioners less often. We also modelled the cost of the diet we were advocating for compared to the one that people were eating when they came into the study and showed that our diet was actually less expensive because we were advocating for things like frozen vegetables, tinned and dried beans and chickpeas and legumes, um, tinned fish, things that were not expensive. And we made the diet very simple, very easy to prepare um, and very achievable. What we've done just recently is look at the particular factors that might have been driving the reduction that we saw, and we're very interested in ultra-processed foods. Ultra-processed foods, many of you will have heard about. It's been in the media a lot recently. And what we sh showed was that for every 10% decrease in the intake of ultra-processed foods by participants, there was an additional two and a half point reduction in MADRAS scores. So they really got a lot of benefit. That was on top of the average seven-point reduction that was seen in the dietary group. So ultra-processed food reduction seemed to be a very powerful way of driving improvements in mental health. When we talk about ultra-processed foods, this is a, a schema of the um, NOVA classification system. This was developed by Carlos Monteira in Brazil, with whom we're, we're collaborating. And this definition has now been used across the world in many different countries and jurisdictions to make dietary recommendations. And so these four, this group four, the ultra-processed foods, are uh, things such as sugar-sweetened beverages, sweet and savoury packaged snacks, things that are reconstituted, foods where they've been taken, they've been broken apart, reconstituted. They might have added vitamin minerals, they might have... Um, you know, if you looked at the label, it might say this is a nutritionally balanced product, but they also will have things like preservatives and colourings and artificial sweeteners and emulsifiers. These foods seem to have a particularly potent impact on health uh, in, in the negative. When we look at the average intake of ultra-processed foods by country, you can see that the USA is leading the way, as you might expect, with roughly, I think the most recent data is about 60% of their average intake of energy is coming from ultra-processed foods. Not just these obvious packaged foods, but things like pre-prepared meals, etc. Um, slightly less in the UK, and you can see that France is uh, just over 30%. So this is affecting countries around the world, and it's because of industry and the activities of industry. When This is a systematic review and meta-analysis that we published a couple of years ago, and you can see the, um, the outcomes that we looked at and the increased uh, incidence of these particular conditions, including, of course, body size, all-cause mortality, 
that depression incidence seems to be um, associated with about a, a 20 to 25 per cent increase in the likelihood of having depression over time if you have a higher intake of these ultra-processed foods. We've just finished a, a nice study with an industry partner where we, we sort of tested this in some way because we really hold the view that foods that are ultra-processed, even if they are apparently nutritionally balanced, do not have the same impact on the body and the brain and the gut that whole foods do. So in this study, we looked at very low calorie diets. Now, these are very commonly consumed by people living with obesity, particularly prior to surgery. They're often shakes and bars. Some of you will have heard of Optifast. I'm not sure what the brands are here in, in France. But if you looked at the label, they would have vitamins and minerals and protein and fiber and all of these things. So you might think that they're nutritionally balanced. And we tested these compared to an equivalent low calorie diet that was made up of whole foods, so vegetables and, and legumes, etc. And our primary outcome was actually the gut microbiota. We had other outcomes as well, but we were primarily interested to know what happened to the gut microbiota um, after uh, several weeks of these diets. Um, these were in women with a larger body size. What we saw was real differences between the two groups at the end of the study, as we would have expected. Now, these data are very new. They haven't yet been published, so if you keep them to yourselves, I'd be very grateful. But it really supported our contention that the impact on the gut microbes was very different for the two different types of foods, even though they were nutritionally somewhat considered to be equivalent. So diversity of the microbes in the gut is a fairly well accepted um, measure of a healthy gut. Now, I'm sure that most of you in the audience understand that there's a gut-brain axis that we've known about for a very long time, linked via the vagus nerve. More recently, though, over the last decade or so, a real understanding that the microbes that live in the gut, not just bacteria, but viruses and fungi and a host of other things, seem to be involved in our mental and brain health, as well as in virtually every other system in the body. 70% of our immune cells are in the gut. They seem to play a very important role in our immune system, our body weight, glucose regulation, the way um, genes are, uh, you know, operate, so many different factors. And a healthier gut microbiota is one that is more diverse. It's more resilient. It has more different types of bacteria, and they're more evenly distributed. So you don't have one dominating, and which can make uh, the gut more vulnerable to pathogens, etc. And so what we saw is that those who had the um, very ultra-processed food diet, there was a small drop in uh, Shannon diversity, which is this measure of diversity, but actually a, a pronounced increase in those um, who had the whole foods diet. So an increase is really what you want to see in the gut microbes. Diversity of the gut has been linked to all of these diseases, and I'm particularly interested in the cancer area because... Many of the data in cancer are coming from large human studies. And what they're showing over and over again is that the diversity of the gut is a predictor of outcomes, particularly for immunotherapy, but also for stem cell transplants, for example, and even chemotherapy. Um, there's actually trials underway at the moment of fecal microbial transplants, so essentially poo transplants, for people who have responded to immunotherapy into those who haven't. And indeed, these FMT trials, these stool transplant trials, are increasingly being conducted right across the world in a host of conditions. The idea being that you take a healthy gut microbiome and you are then able to transplant it into somebody who has a less healthy or less diverse gut microbiome. When we think about our food system and the food that we take in, the diversity of our gut microbes is very much informed by the diversity of our food. So the more plant foods, the more vegetables, fruits, nuts, legumes, seeds, herbs, etc., whole grains, the more diverse your intake of these foods, the more diverse your gut microbiota will be. But of course, our diets have become more and more and more simplified, less and less and less diverse. And we've seen alongside of that, of course, this very rapid increase in the incidence of allergic diseases. So this one on the right is talking about asthma, eczema and hay fever, food allergy. 
but we also see increases in multiple sclerosis, um, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, these, these, um, and type 1 diabetes, these autoimmune conditions. And we believe that this is related to the gut microbes because particularly in infancy, the infant gut microbes actually train the immune system. So because there's been such an impact on the gut microbiome of mothers, of infants, and the general population, we're seeing uh, an apparent reduction in immune function and immune health. We see this as one very nice study, for example, where people moving from more traditional uh, countries, more traditional diets, as they move to the US, their gut microbes become less and less and less diverse. They lose microbes, and that's associated with the increase in um, metabolic syndrome and a whole host of other diseases. So there's been many other studies now uh, in depression looking um, at the impact of dietary interventions. And here's a couple. This one was done quite recently, and it was in young men with depression, again, moderate to severe depression. Now, this is a difficult population to reach. They're usually very resistant to messages about diet. However, they do seem to respond when you put it in the context of their mental and brain health. This is another one. This was a, a study that came soon after ours that had a very nice dose response also with dietary improvement. And again, they did an economic evaluation that showed that it was highly cost-effective to take this approach to treating depression. We led a meta-analysis some while back where we looked at the trials where they had uh, enacted a dietary intervention in other populations. So not depressed populations, but where they had measured depression. And we see that dietary interventions improve depression symptoms as well. So the stage is set now for more studies and um, more tightly controlled studies. We're trying to get funding for these at the moment, but we've also done a very important large effectiveness trial, which I'll talk about shortly. Our Food and Mood Centre, um, I set this up in 2017 and it's grown very rapidly such that we now have um, more than 50 researchers in, in the team. The work that we do spans the life course from early life right through to healthy ageing. We look at um, uh, novel clinical interventions, mechanisms, but also large scale uh, effectiveness, pragmatic trials to look at how we might change the medical system such that people who have a mental disorder like depression can actually access support for their diet and exercise. Um, and we do education and training as well to, to meet that translation gap. One of the things we're very interested in, of course, is the mechanisms that link diet and nutrition to mental and brain health. Um, this is a very nice expert review that we uh, published in Molecular Psychiatry a couple of years ago. And um, here we talk about all of these different factors that we know are involved in the pathogenesis of mental disorders and that are affected by diet. So uh, epigenetics, neurogenesis and the, the, um, the hippocampus, which is highly plastic, inflammation and oxidative stress. That one is very obvious and it was our first target. Stress response system, uh, neurotransmitter uh, metabolism and, and status. Um, mitochondrial dysfunction, but then very much the gut microbiome because we know that this is heavily involved in all of these other factors and seems to regulate them. We have an extensive microbiome research program. We really focus on ensuring world-class standards. We're interested in the infant microbiome, the oral microbiome, and um, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. We're doing clinical trials, epidemiology, and as I said, extending hopefully funding dependent into other disorders. Uh, we did a very nice meta uh, lit systematic literature review published last year in molecular psychiatry. It was the largest one where we looked at the gut microbiota composition of people with and without schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder. And what we saw consistently were differences between those with and without a mental disorder, but we also saw some consistencies across the disorders that related to the pathogenesis of these disorders. We saw lower levels of butyrate producing bacteria. These are, butyrate is anti-inflammatory, seems to be very important in regulating the immune system. We saw changes in bacteria that, um, that synthesize GABA and glutamate. 
and we also saw increases in lactic acid producing bacteria. Now we know that increased lactic acid uh, and lactate is seen in the brain, in the blood of people with these disorders. So whether it's cause and effect, we're not clear on, but we do know that these um, transplantation studies, when you take stool from someone with schizophrenia or with depression and you transplant them into an animal, can induce the, the, the phenotype of that illness with a lot of the biochemical changes as well. So we do believe that there's a causal element to this. We're very interested in how we might modify diets during pregnancy to have an influence on infant um, behavioural and neurodevelopmental outcomes. This is one of the studies we've led where we looked in a large cohort. Um, we showed that mothers' diets, diet quality, was related to children's emotional behavioural outcomes via the gut microbiome. So mothers who had a healthier diet, they had a more diverse microbiome, and that was associated with lower levels of internalising and externalising factors in children. We looked at another study in the same cohort where we saw that infants at one who were carrying Prevotella copri, which is a bacteria that seems to be linked to fibre intake, uh, those who had... Um, Prevotella copri were far less likely to have emotional behavioural disturbances. We ran a clinical trial in women with, um, who were pregnant uh, where we sought to intervene with a gut-focused dietary support uh, program versus those who were just receiving their normal um, care from the obstetrician. And we showed that it really helped them to improve their diet quality and their diet variety and the intake of uh, prebiotic and fermented foods. And we've also seen that there was a difference in the gut microbiome profiles of the infants whose mothers received that dietary intervention. So it's a proof of concept study that you can improve maternal diet to improve the infant uh, microbiome. This is really interesting. And of course, when um, women are pregnant, the microbiome of the mother is producing thousands of molecules that interact with the developing fetus. But then once the babies are born, their own microbiome starts to interact with their, as I said, their immune system and neurodevelopment. We've developed an app based on this um, intervention, which we've just received some funding to do a clinical trial using this app. We're very interested in fermented foods. When you, um, when basically gut microbiota, their primary role is to break down the aspects of food that our own human enzymes can't break down. So these are primarily plant fibre and polyphenols, flavanols, that are in plant foods. When they break these down, it's via a process of fermentation, and in that they produce thousands of different molecules that interact with all of these different systems in the body. When you consume fermented foods, you are basically taking all of those molecules into yourself. So they're doing the same thing, but in a bottle or in a jar. And they have a whole host of impacts on health, they also can have prebiotic fibres to support the gut microbiome and a, a whole host of other uh, outputs, including um, neurotransmitters and a whole host of things, vit vitamins, etc. Now, um, fermented foods have been consumed through traditional diets across the world, and we think that they are potentially really powerful. We've just conducted a fermented dairy trial where we randomised 40 healthy women to receive either fermented dairy or a fermented dairy placebo. So it tasted and felt just like fermented dairy, but it had no bacteria, no bacterial products in it. And again, these data are not yet published, so if you can not tweet them, I'd be grateful. But we did MRI scans on these women, and we had a host of different outcomes that we're working our way through. But what it does look like is that we see an impact on the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus... <laughs> We've been particularly interested in because it's the one region of the brain that, that puts on new neurons, it's highly plastic, it responds to diet, it responds to exercise. It's linked to cognitive health, learning and memory, as well as emotional health and appetite regulation. We've previously run a study where we looked at, there were many animal data, but we looked at this relationship in humans. Older humans where we had brain scans. Now, we know that as people get older, on average, the hippocampus gets smaller. That seems to be part of what drives this uh, reduced cognitive you know, um, ability in, in older adults. 
And we saw this very clear, very strong gradient between the quality of people's diets and the size of their hippocampus. Now, this was a big effect size. It was equivalent to about 60% of the shrinkage in the hippocampus that we might expect to see over, over um, ageing. And there's been two other much larger studies that have replicated this finding. The preliminary findings from our fermented dairy uh, intervention suggest that we have an impact on the hippocampus of this fermented dairy. Now, this is only one glass of this fermented dairy drink a day. Um, so this was really surprising. Again, these are very, very preliminary. We also saw um, a stronger connection between the left hippocampus and the frontal lobe. Um, and we have a number of these significant findings adjusted for multiple comparisons that were, again, surprising in the, um, the effect size. Um, we see an increase in cortical thickness also in those women who receive these, uh, this fermented dairy intervention. We've also just um, conducted a feasibility study of a faecal microbial transplant trial in people with major depressive disorder. So this was 15 people who received a um, enema four days in a row with stool from very healthy donors. We worked with our national stool bank in Australia. I'm on the advisory board. And we wanted to know if this was feasible. We found that all participants attended their dosing appointments. We had no attrition. We had no serious or adverse events, high levels of satisfaction. And with this very tiny sample size, the exploratory data suggested that the FMT treatment may lead to improvements in gastrointestinal symptoms and quality of life. So we're trying to get funding for a much larger study. There are some very interesting case studies in people with severe bipolar disorder that suggest that they've had a complete and sustained remission of their condition uh, with FMT. And there's been a clinical trial conducted in Canada with Valerie Taylor, who um, has looked at this in bipolar disorder. It's not yet published. We've had a big impact on policy um, around the world. So the work that we've led has been reflected in more than 100 high-level policy documents. Um, the most recent World Mental Health Report from the World Health Organization now lists unhealthy diet as a risk factor for mental disorders. So this is really encouraging because we want policymakers to start calculating and integrating the, the burden of poor diet on mental and brain health, not just on chronic illness. We've set up an international task force that is developing the data to be fed into the large global burden of disease study because this is where they can actually do then that diet depression pairing and be able to calculate at the country and region level the potential burden that could be averted by improving diet at the population level. And this is very helpful for, for getting policy change. In Australia, our Royal Australian um, New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, so our peak body, have now put what is essentially lifestyle medicine as the foundation of treatment in their clinical guidelines for the treatment of mood disorders. This is the first time anywhere in the world. They call them foundational. They call them essentially non-negotiable. So this is uh, diet, regular exercise, sleep, and substancization as the foundations before other treatments are commenced. And this is, as I said, it's the first time in the world, but there are many other countries that are looking at this. Um, I've been invited to give a plenary at the Royal College of Psychiatry Conference in a couple of weeks in Liverpool. And I think once we have some of our new data published, which are large and robust, we will see change in clinical guidelines uh, around the world. We also released uh, last year, we published the first set of guidelines, international clinical guidelines for the application of lifestyle-based care in depression treatment. So this was a global task force um, conducted with the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry. And that was published last year. So that was a massive undertaking, three years worth of work led by Wolfgang Marx and our team, um, who spent years, really, um, grading all the evidence very rigorously with the task force and producing this document, more than 80,000 words, with um, evidence-based recommendations that grades the evidence at this point. But of course, we know that physicians are often very, very poorly trained in nutrition. So this is a very nice um, international uh, survey that was done by colleagues of ours, Sabrina Merkel in Germany. She's a psychiatrist uh, 
and they looked at psychiatrists all around the world and found that the large majority of them uh, had no training in nutrition. Um, and less than 1% rated their nutrition education as very good. But concerningly, many of them were making recommendations that were not evidence-based for particular dietary strategies or supplements, things like this, which can actually do more harm than good. So there's an urgent training and education gap here that we are working to address. We've set up our Food and Mood Academy. So here we're doing a lot of education and training so that clinicians and people everywhere can access the evidence-based information to make sure that they can put what we have um, understood from the research into clinical practice. Our first offering was a free online course. This is one of the most um, popular courses in the world now. It's enrolled more than 80,000 people from more than 190 countries to teach people about food and mood and how what they eat can influence their mental and brain health. It's designed for the general public. It's been enormously successful. But more recently, we worked over a period of time with our Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists to develop accredited training for psychiatrists, psychologists, other medical professionals, so that they understood what the evidence was, but not just that, how to actually put it into practice, how to, to speak to their patients. And we're doing many workshops as well. And this is one of the wonderful uh, events that we held with Fundamental yesterday um, to you know, upskill people in the knowledge in this area. We're working on school educational programs. This is a book that my husband and I wrote, really designed to help children to make healthier food choices by talking about their gut bacteria. So this has been very popular, and we're hoping to use this as the basis of, of programs for, for early life settings. But of course, unless we can address the industrialised food environment, it's very, very difficult to get people to individually change their behaviour. When everywhere they go, there are these opportunities to consume these ultra-processed foods, less so in France, but still increasingly in this area, um, that are, they interact with the reward systems of the brain. They really prompt um, the desire to keep consuming them. We know this from clinical trials in the US. They seem to bypass the body and the brain's natural appetite regulation systems. There's been two clinical trials that have shown just a week, even less than a week, on a Western-type diet in young, healthy people. It uh, had an impact on hippocampal-dependent learning and memory and interfered with their satiety programming, their appetite regulation, such that they wanted more of these types of foods. They seem to interact with these reward systems, and in young people, they're particularly vulnerable to these things that interfere with the reward system and program them to mock more and more of these foods. We know from the United Nations Food System Summit, from the very large report, that the cost of our global food environment, as well as being the leading cause of illness and early death, is also the leading cause of loss of biodiversity the leading cause of water usage. It costs the globe 20 trillion US dollars a year. 11 trillion of that is in the form of the impact on human health. 7 trillion is on the impact of the, on the environment. The way we are farming foods, the way we're farming cattle, the antibiotics in the food chain, the herbicides, the pesticides, the very intense monocultures, all of these things contribute to food that has lower levels of these phytochemicals, lower levels of nutrients, and exposing us to a whole host of things that we know are having a negative impact on our microbiome and on our, our own human biodiversity. This is a very good book that I'm reading at the moment. If you'd like to understand more about the soil and how the way your food is grown is such an important uh, determinant of the healthfulness of your food, and your own biodiversity. This is a really terrific one. I'm on the steering committee for the New Frontiers of Nutrition that's led by the World Economic Forum, and um, I've been able to get them to move away from talking about metabolic health and body weight to talking about the brain and the gut as the focus of food policy. And we, um, that has many players from the food industry involved, so we really hope that they're starting to shift away from these highly processed foods to ones that are more health-promoting. 
the Brain Capital Alliance, which I know Marion is, is closely involved with as well. This is a global alliance that's really arguing for investment in things that optimise our mental and brain health across the life course. And uh, this is philanthropic investment, it's policy investment, it's research investment. So there's a lot going on internationally in this field that's very interesting. We are doing large-scale effectiveness trials in the real world. Can diet and exercise be used to support people's mental health in clinical settings? We have a very important trial, that the results of which are uh, submitted and under review at the moment for publication. We're doing another one that's uh, for the whole of Australia to really inform medical care. We're doing um, placebo-controlled digital trials and developing our digital uh, ability to support patients as well. We're trying to get funding to do, and we're doing small uh, randomised placebo-controlled feeding trials. So these are when people get all of their food delivered to them so that uh, it's less um, vulnerable to bias. We're very interested in, in personalised psychiatry. How do we use big data to develop a clear understanding of um, the pathogenesis of uh, these disorders, but also who will respond to what treatment under what circumstance. And we've got a lot of work happening in this space at the moment. Um, we're also very interested in future foods. How can we help to develop the new uh, types of foods that can still be used with a, a, a long shelf life? They can be shipped to places where they might not have any refrigeration, but that are health enhancing rather than health degrading. How do we develop um, compounds that can go into ultra-processed foods to help to mitigate the health impacts. This is another area of work that we're doing. So if people are interested, please go to the Food and Mood Centre website. There's a lot of information on there. Uh, we're hoping to develop uh, some of these educational programs for um, the French setting as well, which is really exciting. And there are many, many things here that I haven't had a chance to talk about that we're, we're um, working on. Uh, so please watch the literature because you'll see many other studies come out in the very near future. So I hope you found that interesting and thank you so much for your time today.